I love this house. On January 20th, 1942, 15 men gathered in a private villa outside Berlin. This meeting is not taking place. They dined on the finest foods and wines. Not bad for French. And in a meeting that lasted two hours, they would change the world forever. This is more than war. Must be a different word for this. Every record of their meeting was destroyed. Today, each of us becomes a bearer of secrets. Except one. The brief remains clear. All of Europe, no Jews. Not one. I am speaking! Auschwitz, isolated and close to significant rail access. Systematically annihilate all the Jews of Europe. The Jews haul the bricks, and they build the buildings themselves. The method is now defined. Kenneth Branagh, Stanley Tucci. Get them on the trains. A secret meeting, a hidden document. Conspiracy. This is how it happened. It was the most disturbing experience of my 20-year acting career. So said Kenneth Branagh of his role as Reinhard Heydrich, the man who chaired the Vanse Conference, the subject of the 2001 film Conspiracy, which is our film club movie today. On the 20th of January 1942, 15 men met in a luxurious villa in a wealthy suburb on the outskirts of Berlin. Their task was to agree a way forward in what became the Holocaust, but what the participants described as the final solution to the Jewish question. Here are some of the opening remarks from Heydrich, as played by Brenner. We have a storage problem in Germany with these Jews. And there have been conversations for almost a year now about this Jew and that Jew and the complexities of the law. And this problem, as you, I'm sure, know, has tormented us. As you know, we first undertook to expel them from all means by which our people would have to deal with them. Every sphere of life of our German people. The laws we enacted at Nuremberg, and we should all drink a toast to Dr. Stuckert for devising them. <coughs> the co-author, uh, modestly, I am the co-author. They established the fundamental legality for the creation of a Jew-free society, a Jew-free economy for the world to see. And we indeed have eliminated the Jew from our national life. Now, more than that, the Jew himself must be physically eradicated from our living space. On the 82nd anniversary of that meeting, Roger Morehouse, friend of the show and historian of Nazi Germany, joins me to discuss the history behind the movie, as well as the film itself. This episode is particularly important, as here in the West we see a worrying rise in anti-Semitism. Now, the rather inferior trailer at the top of the show does make the movie sound like a Nazi version of Downton Abbey, but nothing could be further from the truth. Also starring Stanley Tucci, Colin Firth, David Threlfall and Barnaby Kay, as well as a bevy of other actors who'll look familiar, it grips from the start. Links to everything we discuss are in the show notes, and please do get in touch if you have any comments. Plenty more great history to come, including the War of 1812 and the Battle of New Orleans, Checkpoint Charlie, and our Great British Commanders series continues with Gordon and I chatting some of the also-rans after we settled on Haig and Slim for World War I and World War II, respectively. Now, listeners, I'd really appreciate it if you could give this little pod a five-star rating on Spotify or Apple and share with friends. It means so much and it helps it grow. In the meantime, I'm going to hand you over to myself and Roger Morehouse discussing the film Conspiracy. Great, Roger, welcome. It's great to have Thank you on. You, the, uh, you, this is your, um, uh, you're actually a substitute guest for our film club. A Wow, thanks. Yeah. <laughs> what an opening that is. <laughs> You're you're replacing Tim Hewitt, who's the film director, who's filming as we speak. But I've got a far better guest now. That, it's, it, that's, better. that's better. Yes. Ro Roger Morehouse, the distinguished, acclaimed historian of Nazi Germany. And that's, that's going to be relevant for our discussion. And, and Roger, you should tell the listeners, you're also a medal holder from the state of from the Polish state, aren't you? Yes, uh, I, I've been awarded the uh, no, the Order of Merit of the Republic of Poland, fifth class, I'll have you know, fifth class. Uh, now, I, I, I received that a few years ago for um, my previous book, First to Fight, about the September campaign. So that's a, and that's a lovely thing. It's a lovely thing to, to have your work honoured in that way. So uh, 
It uh, is. That's we, why we, I mentioned we, it. We Roger. joke. We joke about it, but it's uh, it is a lovely thing. Oh yeah, I, I didn't mention it to make fun. No, of I know. I joke. I joke about it. Do but you? Uh, you know, it is it is hanging in the loo, and it's a it's a lovely thing. Well, well, Roger, it's great to have you on. I know you're. Um, you also appear on the Battleground podcast. Yes, as a sort of first reserve. Again, a bit Again. like now, Ollie. Always the bridesmaid. <laughs> Always the bridesmaid. Exactly. <laughs> so, and then we're going to be discussing today. We are talking about the film Conspiracy, indeed, starring Kenneth Branagh and Stanley Tucci. But really, it's all about the Van Say Conference, which was held. And if you're listening to this when it comes out, which is on the 20th of January, that's this Saturday, Saturday the 20th of January, that is the 82nd anniversary of the Van Say Conference, which was the meeting for the the actual horrors of the Holocaust. The Holocaust is set in motion as a result of this meeting. Is that fair to say there, Roger? Uh, that's That's the conventional interpretation, which I have to say is probably kind of wrong. Um, the Holocaust is that is already happening in January forty two, right? So what what the what the Vance Conference is, and this comes across really well in the film. What the Vance Conference is is kind of Heydrich, who is Himmler's deputy in the SS, basically saying to these various uh, mandarins, most of them are civil senior civil servants within the various ministries, most of them about fifteen men in that room. Uh, and what Heydrich is calling them together to do is to basically say, this is what's going on. And I'm in charge of it. And all of the rest of you do not have effectively do not have a say. We're all complicit in what's going on. We all know what's going on. So none of you can claim not to have known. But at the same time, I'm in charge and you will answer to me. So he's established, you know, we, we think of Nazi Germany in a way as a sort of perfect hierarchy almost, you know, this idea of the Fuhrer principle and Hitler at the top of a perfect kind of triangular hierarchy. And to some extent that is the case, but then to a large extent it also isn't. Um, Hitler doesn't have his finger in every single pie. He's not on top of, you know, he's a dilettante. He gets up at midday. He he stays up late at night, watches watches movies in his own in his own little um, in his own little world. So, none of which is to say that he was he was ignorant of the Holocaust, of course, because it's absolutely central to what the Nazi project was. But it wasn't that sort of Im imagined perfect hierarchy. And if you know, when you think about how Nazi Germany operated. Um, particularly with these various paladins, with, you know, with Goering, with Himmler, with Heydrich and others. The best way to imagine it is not of a perfect hierarchy, is of rats fighting in a sack, I always think. You know, there was so, so many tensions there. There were so many sort of competing interests. They were literally competing amongst amongst themselves for influence, for Hitler's ear, for money, for competence, uh, all of these, all of these things, and you can see that in in the Van Say Conference. So all of that informs what the Van Van Say Conference is. Is Heydrich basically saying, "This is my fiefdom, right? You all know it's happening, so you can't, you know, is establishing general complicity. You all know it's going on because I'm telling you about it, but you all answer to me. This is my fiefdom. Don't mess it up, right? So that's what he's doing. Um, so the idea of this being sort of a kickoff meeting for the Holocaust is kind of is is kind of right, but kind of wrong at the same time. So it's both it's both deeper and more mundane than that, if that makes sense. And so it was this a kind of because um, I was thinking this watching it again. Heydrich's very I mean, he dominates that meeting. He's yeah. the chairperson, but he's also there's no doubt any doubt that there is is he clears up very quickly. Yeah, that he is in charge. Now, yeah. is this I was thinking this whilst watching it. Is this because Heydrich was this is a kind of power grab for Heydrich and the Holocaust is a way of of him gaining power in that if he successfully exterminates Jews, the Roma, homosexuals, the mentally infirm, etc then he will be the sort of first among equals to take over one day. Mm. And so that that's really why he's doing it. How, or, or has he been asked by Himmler, look, we need to ramp this stuff up. You need to, you need to, because Himmler's his superior, I think. Yeah, yeah. 
you need to ramp this up. We need to we need to exterminate all the Jews in Europe. Yeah, to 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 some extent that it it is it is the latter. He's he's not necessarily sort of stamping his his um, own position on it. He has been given that task. He was given that task um, by Goering effectively to sort of coordinate this operation, and it needed many, as you can imagine, anything of that scale needed the co- collaboration and cooperation of lots of ministries and lots of different bodies within the within the organisations. So the SS couldn't do that alone. So. You know, the, the the mass killing of the Holocaust is really going on um, from the previous summer of 1941 onwards. And that's that opening phase, which is which is expressed in this uh, in, in conspiracy very, very well. The opening phase is what's known as the Holocaust by bullets, which is where the Einsatzgruppen, these famous Einsatzgruppen um, of led by the SS. But generally, you know, what they tended to be were sort of reserve soldiers and reserve policemen very often you know, middle-aged, sort of pot-bellied, uh, you know, 40-year-old reserve policemen. Um, so not really fit for frontline combat, but they were good for shooting civilians, basically. So they, they they had this phase of mass shooting, basically. The most egregious example being Babi Yar outside Kiev, which came into the news last year, if you remember, after the Russians uh, shelled the memorial site at Babi Yar just outside Kiev. And at Babi Yar, for example, which is the worst example, 33,000 people were killed over a couple of days in, uh, I think it was late September of 1941. Um, and this was that phase of just sort of rounding up Jews and taking them outside of town and, and shooting them into pits, basically. So it's a very kind of agricultural, it's very brutal method uh, of killing. So this is already going on. And even even the more sort of industrial killing process, so they're already looking, the Germans are looking at the end of 41 for different ways uh, to carry out mass killing. And in a strange, this might sound strange, they're looking for more humane ways of carrying out mass killing. And that's humane for the killers, not for the killed. It's crucial to. Yeah, this is mentioned by one of the characters in the the drama. Yeah. Rudolf Lang. Is that a name? Rudolf Langer was, uh, I mean, he's he's a, I think, I mean, he was, this is, you have to say conspiracy is very close to the historical record. Um, There are no characters there that were invented. They are all the characters that were at the conference. And Rudolf Langer was the head of the Sicherheitsdienst, so the security service of the SS. Uh, he had just participated and led this extermination operation in Estonia, uh, in the Baltic. Uh, and Estonia, as they mention in the in the film and is mentioned in the Vance Protocol, Estonia was the only part of Europe that was already Jew free, as the Nazis put it, Judenrein. Uh, because Langer had done, done such a good job of exterminating um, the Jews of, of Estonia. So he was one of those that was at that sharp end of the Einsatzgruppen killings, right? Um, and this, and I thought his portrayal actually was really, really interesting because, you know, he chain smokes all the way through the whole thing, which is not that unusual, but I think I think that's used as a sort of shorthand for for some degree of, of mental anguish. Um, so he chain smokes throughout the whole thing. And there's one particular interjection where they're all talking in euphemisms um, about evacuation to the east is the favorite is the favorite euphemism for, you know, what you're going to do to the Jews. And he stands up in this conference and he says, and I've just come back from Riga. He talks about Riga in Latvia as well. And just to be clear about what we're talking about, he says, he, he says, I have been evacuating uh, 30,000 Jews to the east by shooting. He says, and he says it's important that we that we understand what words mean. So he's kind of blowing away all of this sort of obfuscation and, and use of euphemism by just saying, just to be clear, is this what we're talking about? What I've been doing, mass shooting, uh, is what you're talking about. You know, so just to clarify, and there's a wonderful, I and mean, it happens a few times in it where, you know, they have a stenographer uh, in the room who's writing everything down. And this is, I think it, one of those moments is is exactly then where you see Stanley Tucci's character, who is adult, um, uh, Eichmann, who looks around at the stenographer and sort of shakes his head or wag, wags his finger, says, don't record that. No, so the record had to be clean. The record had to have the euphemism and not the truth of what was going on. So that was the opening phase, right? This mass, this mass progress of mass shooting. And they're already experimenting with other methods late in 41. So all of that is already going on by the time that this group meet early in 1942. 
So it's not as though this is like a kickoff meeting. This is where, you know, this is what we're going to do and blah, blah, blah. It is relatively close to the beginning of the process, but that's already happening. So what Heydrich is doing is making sure that there's coordination between all of those offices of state, that they're all pulling in the same direction, that he's established his command over it crucially and that's because he was a very ambitious individual i mean like as you said your initial question um so it's a little bit of both it is an ongoing process in which he has to sort of you know um create some sort of hierarchy create uh a, a workable system and at the same time you know there's undeniable that he he is personally ambitious and wants this to be sort of a, you know his signature uh, achievement in the third reich but it's it's a huge thing you know they're talking about you know not just as we now know the six million of the holocaust they're talking about you know um killing all of the jews of all of europe so there's this list within the hydra within the uh Vance protocol um and this is all referenced in the film as well where you know you're talking about 11 and i think there's 11 and a half million jews and they're talking about the jews of switzerland the jews of sweden the jews of ireland yeah so he, the, he the ambition is huge yeah. is to actually cleanse as they put it cleanse all of europe even neutral europe and the areas of europe unoccupied by the germans all of that was to be cleansed in this in this plan so it's absolutely enormous the casting of it mm. is kenneth branner uh, who, who plays Heydrich. Because uh, when you look at pictures of Hydra, he has this kind of angular face. Yes. Whereas... It's like a horse, I always think. He's got a horse. Yeah, face. yeah, yeah. It is a bit like that. Yeah. And, uh, but but Branner's a little bit more of a sort of, he's got a nice, friendly, pudgy sort of um, yeah. Ray, yeah. face. So it's, but I, that kind of um, falls away, though, those any thoughts of sort of friendliness fall away. Yes. away uh, he's because... cold. He's very, very cold. It's a remarkable, I think it's a remarkable performance. He he won an Emmy for it, I think. Brilliant. I mean, totally deserved. I mean, he completely, you're right. I mean, you know, in terms of physiognomy and physically, he doesn't really look like Heydrich, as you say. He's quite sort of, you know, uh, dare I say, sort of chubby of chubby of countenance. Um, but yeah, sort of friendly face. And he doesn't have at all that sort of horse face that, that uh, Heydrich had. But once... Once he gets going acting, you know, doing that wonderful thing that he does acting, he just seems to inhabit Heydrich. And there's this, how, how would we describe it? It's sort of a comradely coldness about him. So he's he's all he can be all smiles, but it's quite a sort of it's quite a cold smile as well. Yeah. The moment he's challenged, yeah, he's absolutely on it straight away. Yeah, so and, he's and very think... quick to sort of stamp down any any you know. A threat to his authority real or perceived uh in that and that comes across so well and he does it so well as well Branagh. um it you know he he's a, it with very in very short order he establishes his absolute control over that room it's it's a remarkable thing to see yeah the only the only time he really comes into a kind of um a little bit of a bump in the road is is dealing with the i think his name is Kritzinger. Kritzinger. Yeah. Yes, played yeah. by Dave played brilliantly by David Threlfall. Threlfall. Yeah. And Stuckert as well. So the And two, Stuckert. Yeah, I mean two. Stuckert, Colin Firth. Yes. I think when 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 William Stuckert, the author of the Nuremberg Laws, yeah, is trying to impose some kind of morality on a meeting like that, you know, you, you know that this Yeah, is well, I mean we have to be a bit careful here. And this this where this is where I think this is where conspiracy, the film, strays from Vance Conference, the truth, uh, the historical event, um, because I think it's, it, it is in the record that Stuckert did protest. Now, he was the author of the Nuremberg Laws, as you said, in 1935. He was a, you know, a legal man, um, first and foremost. Um, and he was primarily concerned you know, he was in uh, a state secretary in the in the Ministry of Interior, but he was primarily concerned with the writing of German law, the functioning of German law, and what he saw in those plans for evacuation to the east, in inverted commas, was uh, a sort of a trampling over those legal principles that he'd rather painstakingly established. And particularly one of the things that they obsessed about at the Vance Conference was the definitions of sort of liminal groups of Jews, like what they called Mischlinger, those of mixed race, and precisely what defined 
uh, a Jew in those liminal cases, whether you were Jewish or not. And that obviously would decide your fate. Now, he'd already done that to a large extent in the in the Nuremberg laws. So what he was objecting to was a was a, a sort of a post facto and rather haphazard trampling upon the legal principles that he'd established. But it wasn't necessarily it wasn't out of a sense of morality. Um, and there's a wonderful scene there where he's challenged by, you know, the, the one of the uh, party representatives, Gerhard Klopfer, this this rather poor sign, you know, very fat um, in a, in the brown uniform. Yeah, um, in played by Ian McNeese. Ian disgusting. McNeese. I mean, disgusting. he is disgusting. He's yeah. utterly re- repellent character. Um, and he basically accuses Stuckert of being a Jew lover. And he says, I hate the Jews just as much as you do. I just understand, you know, I understand their genius and I understand how, you know, how devious they are. So it's a, it's an amazing scene. Uh, where he's confronted and he responds with real anger but he you know he's not doing this out of love for the jews he's doing it because he understands how devious they are and the and and the and the legal case kind of for that reason has to be watertight which he says it's not so that 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 scene is 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 brilliant in the film um and the record tells us that stuckert did object to this kind of rather rather haphazard sort of trampling over his legal principles, but the bit that isn't in the historical record is uh, is Kritzinger. In, in, interestingly, so I think Kritz, you know, Kritzinger doesn't really feature in the historical record. He, there's no mention of him really, apart from his participation. There's no mention of him contributing to the conference at all in in the historical record. So he was a permanent secretary in the Reich Chancellery. So again, you know, he's one of those you know, a senior Mandarin, but in a different office sort of thing, and. I think that to some extent his objections are invented for the for the sake of dramatic narrative. So they have these two characters that that protest against what's going on in Kritzinger and uh, and Stuckert. Stuckert definitely yes, Kritzinger much less so. And I think having read up a bit a bit about this, I think that the reason they chose Kritzinger to to play that role is partly because you know there was no record of him saying anything at all crucially but also after the war he lived shortly you know a couple of years after the war died i think um from memory i think about 47 he did s- express some regrets for you know have for having participated in fact what had been done uh after the war so perhaps they're just sort of projecting that backwards but you know, to some extent you know his intervention is is a is a dramatic invention uh, for the sake of the film, but it kind of needed that because there, you know, there was with the, with the exception of what Stuckert does, which is not out, as I said, is not out of you know sympathy or morality or love for the Jews or anything. Um, with the exception of that, there is unanimity around that table as to what they're doing, and that would make a, make for a fairly fairly boring film. Yeah. So they had to create some, you know, that you needed that degree of conflict, uh, even if it had to be exaggerated and event, invented. But it, what's interesting is it shows that even if you provide any kind of objection in that meeting in Stickett's case yeah maybe slightly ego driven as well the fact that they're trampling yeah. over his work yeah it does because it's so horrific what they're discussing it it you're looking as a as a viewer for someone please someone show yeah. some kind of um objection yeah and even though Stuckert is doing it for, yeah, I mean, they're still deeply anti-Semitic and yeah. reasons. He's doing it for personal reasons and for yeah. legalistic reasons, yeah. but he's still, you know, absolutely yeah. anti-Semitic. He's still absolutely, you know, on, on, uh, on message as far as the Nazis were concerned. No, you're right. And it's, and it, and it's, it's almost an exercise in a way, or it's a demonstration of, you know, that, that great line from Har- Ar- Hannah Arendt, she's talking about the Eichmann trial. It's, it, it, it's the banality of evil. Because to a large extent, they're ordinary men. I mean, ordinary. I mean, look, there's 15 men in that room. They are all, with a couple of exceptions, but they're all highly educated. There are eight doctorates in the room, for example. Uh, mostly Including in that Einsatzgruppen chap, um, yeah. Langer. Yeah. yeah. Um, so, you know, the, it, it, and there's a, again, there's a wonderful scene from where, where Klopfer actually says this. He says, well, how many of us are... Uh, uh, have studied law and sort of eight of them put their hands up and he goes oh god no not more lawyers you know 
but it, it, it's true you know this is this is this is uh, the, the senior legal representatives of, of the third reich discussing the crime of the centuries it's quite an astonishing scene so yeah but but you're not you're not hearing anyone really making any any sort of objection so there and it's all discussed in the in to a large extent in the most sort of banal sort of bureaucratic terms um so it is it's that it's that um uh, but you wouldn't have got an objection anyway no of course no, <laughs> because absolutely. you would have been you would have been sent to saxonhausen or something of course yeah and that's yeah. and that's i mean that's an interesting point actually which which points up how we know about the vanse conference at all this is one character in this martin luther which is actually Martin Luther, but you know, a, a latter day Martin Luther, and not uh, not the uh, Protestant reformer. He was a representative of the Foreign Office at the conference of the German Foreign Office, so he was one of uh, Ribbentrop's deputies. And they were all given a protocol, so I, I the minutes of the meeting uh, afterwards, and all of those other copies, all of the other fourteen copies, disappeared either soon afterwards or or at the end of the war, in the chaos of the end of the war. And only Luther survived. So that's the only one that actually survived the war. And the reason it survived was that he himself crossed Ribbentrop at some point later in the war, 43, 44, I think, and actually found himself being sent very, you know, as you just suggested, he was sent to Sachsenhausen. So he lived out the end of the war. He died of a heart attack, I think, right at the end of the war, either either just before or just after you know the, the liberation of the camp and the reason that his copy of the protocol survived was that he wasn't around to 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 dispose of it it's as simple as that um so then that was discovered by the americans in 47 as they were sort of going through the uh you know the german archives and going through the you know the filing cabinets in the foreign office and so on uh and they found this this protocol of the Vance conference were it not for uh that particular oversight on luther's part we wouldn't know about it. We wouldn't be having this conversation. There'd be no film. It's quite astonishing. Amazing, amazing. And Stuckert, I was reading into this, and it might be a bit of conspiracy theory. Um, Stuckert, I think, was killed in a car crash in yeah. in fifty one. Yeah. But there is some suggestion that perhaps the Mossad went for him. Yeah. Yeah, I've heard that as well. I don't know what the proof is of that. It's quite possible, I suppose. He was. He was very prominent in that uh, as we said in drawing up the Nuremberg laws and creating that legal structure this is another thing that I mean I talk about this and horribly um, horribly self-promoting but I'll mention my, my, my please do book, my recent book the forgers but what comes across out of that and it does here as well is that you know I think we imagine the Holocaust almost as a sort of a, a frenzy of killing and on one level it was of course you look at those Einsatzgruppen killings of course they are kind of frenzied they are brutal um, but crucially, everything that happened had to have a sort of legal structure around it. So there's this curious, le- curiously legalistic nature of what the Third Reich is doing, even if even in in its most brutal moments. Um, so that and you can see that in what Stuckert did, you know, cre- creating the legal definition of what was a Jew, because crucially, you know, it, to uh, in Jewish culture and and, and in Judaism. You know, there's a religious definition of who is a Jew because it comes down the matrilineal line, right? So, um, so someone whose father is Jewish, for example, mother is not Jewish, then you're not Jewish as far as as far as other Jews are concerned, and religiously not Jewish, and culturally necessarily not necessarily Jewish. So, but that's different from how the Nazis uh, defined what was a Jew, right? So, you know, you could have a sort of secularized couple who no, were no longer observant, but both came from sort of full Jewish background. Um, but to the Nazis, those they are both Jews. I mean, even if you convert to Christianity, but you're, you know, they saw it in race terms, right? So that for that reason, you know, they had to have some sort of legal definition of what was a Jew, because the 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 Jewish definition of what was a Jew didn't work for them because it wasn't by race. So, so that was why, in a way, that you know, Stuckert had to do what he did at the Nuremberg Laws. But again, you've got this sort of, you know, this, you know, the, the whole legal processes around. You know, um, the isolation of the Jews up until 39, marginalization, you know, how they're sort of excluded from the various professions and so on, um, how they're excluded from wider society. And then even even up to their deportations, you know, when you received your deportation notice, um, you know, it had on the front page all the all the paragraphs of German law that the deportation was based on. So this was as far as as far as they were concerned, the recipients 
This was a legal process. This was entirely legal, um, which is partly why the vast majority of those that received the deportation notices went along with it. You know, um, turned up for their deportation, got on the trains, and and went to their went to their fate. So there's this sort of legalistic element around it. This sort of legal structure around it is actually really really important. And Stuckert was the was the you know primary architect of all of that. Um, so you can see why he would be someone who potentially, you know, post-war might be targeted by, by people like Mossad. Um, but you know, whether truth of that, you know, I have, yeah, I have no yeah. insight on. So there's an interesting scene where a character, Otto Hoffman, who is yeah. seated next to, um, Kritzinger. That's the Kritzinger. Yeah. Yes. And he is an SS Gruppenführer. I'm looking at the cast list here. Nicholas yeah. Woodison plays him brilliantly. And he's, SS Gruppenführer Otto Hoffmann. He's the chief of the SS Race and Settlement main office, so not disposed to any kind of sympathy yeah. um, for uh, any of the uh, Jewish people who are going to be slaughtered. But he has a kind of episode where he goes, yeah. he doesn't feel well, and it's round about the time they're talking about killing. Basically. And then he manages to blame it on a bad cigar. Right? Yeah, and yeah. and you know he's sort of he goes to the bathroom. He's consoled by his by his colleague Langer, actually. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's a difficult. I I'm not sure I can shed any light of that on that because as as you say, it's probably it's, invented. But it, I think it's... it probably is again for dramatic purposes. There's no reason for someone, you know, in the SS working in the race and resettlement office. These are the people who are very much, you know, they're the sharp end of what's going on they're under no illusions as to what's going on or indeed what they have in mind so the idea that he would have a sort of sudden fit of scruples or a sudden you know uh, uh you know realization that this is the truth of what they're doing is slightly nonsensical well they were they're all eating before during after and yeah. you know it's really well done because you see the beginning of the the vans and i wanted to ask you about the actual location but um the Vance mm. villa itself but the, the 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 chefs the kitchens produce this sort of i'm sure uh luxurious food given it was in mid during yeah, the yeah. second world war and, yeah. and probably difficult to get hold of of ingredients but it's disgusting watching them eat stuffing their faces of with you know pork and pear roasted yeah. and and they're all drinking as well, one and smoking nonstop. I mean, yeah, that's all a bit you'd too have, much. You just struggled. All sounds like an, it sounds like an aspects dinner. Yeah, it does actually, doesn't it? Aspects just, of history, just dinner, just yes. without the political opinions. <laughs> yes, yes, yeah. <laughs> but no, I mean, um, no, I, I, I mean, the house, the house itself, it still stands. It's still there. It's, it, if you, you know, anyone listening, if you're going to Berlin, go and see it. It's a fabulous museum now. But the house is still in the same state that it was at the time, to a large extent. I mean, with you know, uh, it, it wasn't damaged during the war, for example. It was used post-war as for various things. Um, it was used as sort of a school and a and a, uh, a sort of technical training college and things like that. And it's there's a couple of lines there where Heydrich in the film where he says, you know, I want to make this my house. And apparently that was the case. He did want to, you know, that he had it earmarked as his his residence. Um, after the war of course he didn't survive to see the see after the war um but it's an interesting place it it, it was it was they again they mention it in the film um it had belonged to a, a jewish industrialist um who'd been disenfranchised and and removed and then was used at the time that this happened in 42 it was used by the ss as kind of a, a high-end sort of guest house for visiting dignitaries, for visiting SS generals, for example, you've come to come to um, Berlin to have a you know conference with Himmler or whatever it might be. They might, if you're lucky, they might put you up in the in the uh, in the Vansay Villa. So it worked, in that sense, it's absolutely correct. So it had all those staff, you know, would have been accustomed to to having meetings like like they had there. So, and it is it is a fascinating building and and, the, and beautiful. I mean, the the, the location right on the Vansay Lake is is stunning, and it's a very elegant part of Berlin. You know, out to the southwestern suburbs. So it's a really beautiful place to go. And curiously, I went, I've been there many times and I was there once it's going back a few years. And right next door to it is a is a beautiful beer hall, like a like a big um, beer garden, you know. And I was sitting, I'd been in the working in the archive in there and I went next door to have some something to eat and a beer. And I was sitting in the sunshine 
And the only the only sort of table left was was to share one with this German couple who was sitting there. And I sort of said, do you mind if I sit down? And they said, yeah, sure. I sat down and they sort of uh, we started talking and they said, well, what, you know, we're talking in German. And they said, what what have you been doing? What are you doing here? Realizing I was foreign. And I said, oh, I've just been working in the in the Vance Villa next door. I've been researching in the Vance Villa. In, on the assumption, perhaps lazily, that everyone in Germany knew what the Vanse Villa was, and they looked blank, blankly at me, and I said, "You know where where the Vanse conference happened? You know the the Holocaust and blank. You know nothing. You know they just well I, maybe I'm just assuming too much, but I found that quite quite surprising that even when I explained it, they had no knowledge of the Vanse conference whatsoever. I don't think it's that obscure, but anyway, um, it's I extraordinary. Thought, I found that quite surprising. Well, it's interesting you say that because, I mean, this film, whilst it's a TV film, I think it, it had quite a big impact at the time. Um, yeah. But there are two German versions and one that just came out last year. Yeah, and there was a, an earlier German version as well. Yeah, one, one from the 80s, I think. Yes, yeah. yes, which I haven't yeah. seen, actually. I should, I should no, watch it. I haven't those. either. I mean, but, it, there was a phase of this. I mean, there was a great book came out. Mark Roseman wrote a book around the same time, around the millennium, I think it was. He's, he's a, a, he was then, I think he still is. He was an academic at Sa Southampton University. And he wrote a really good book on this, very short. I do like short history books, I'll, I'll be honest, um, called the, the Villa, the Lake, the Meeting. Um, and it's just, it's just the story of the Vance Conference, the participants, you know, what they decided, what they didn't, you know, the myth, the mythology around it. It's just a sort of really good, accessible account of all of this. And that came out around the, around the same time. So there's, there's quite a lot of, I think there's a decent amount of knowledge about Vance now uh, and the significance of it and what it is and what it isn't, I think, crucially as well. As I said, it is, it is slightly more complex than just imagining it as, a, you know, the kickoff meeting for the Holocaust. I mean, that works for shorthand. But it's but it's a bit more complicated than that. Yeah, it's marketed it there, or at least it was marketed in that way. I mean, it's it's interesting that it is so thrilling to as a thriller. You are yeah. on the edge, but it's basically fifteen men in a room just talking. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's a, it's a bit like Twelve Angry Men in that sense. You know, there's yeah. this is the thing. I know when we were talking before, and you have these various categories that you suggested of you know, best scene, for example. Well, the whole thing is almost one scene, right? Yeah. Because um, it is literally 15 men in a room. And then there's there's a couple of, there's a couple of kind of breakout scenes, you could say, where, you know, like you mentioned the uh, Hoffman, I think it was, who goes to the, goes to the bathroom. And there are various other little scenes that are sort of extraneous to that main thing. But and it's pretty much an hour and a half of, of 15 men in a room. So you could, it, it's almost just one scene in itself, you know, it's not, it, it, which yeah, is makes it difficult so. to answer that particular it, it uh, does. That particular category. But, I mean, but, but there's such tension is developed within that. I mean, it's a, I think it's a brilliant piece of filmmaking. It really is. And so often now, I think, you know, I'm sounding like an old man, but so often now you, you see films where it's all about, it's all about special effects. It's all about, um, you know, set pieces, which can be brilliant very often. But always at the expense of sort of characterization of genuine of developing genuine human drama, uh, and this has got characterization. It's got human drama in spades without any set pieces. You know, without them, without them ever leaving the room. So I think it's a masterpiece of filmmaking. Well, we should mention then the director. It's Frank Pearson. Yeah. So he might not be a household name, but you'll have heard of some of the films he wrote. He wrote Cool Hand Luke. Oh God! Right. <laughs> And he wrote Dog Day Afternoon. Wow. Which, well, yeah. I mean, yeah, absolutely. That's a CV to die for right there. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Um, and I think he got the Oscar for Dog Day Afternoon. And he also directed the 70s version of A Star Is Born. One, a actually, well, another thing, Ollie, I was going to mention, talking about how the film was put together. When you watch it, you realise there is no score, right? There's no... There's no sort of added drama by having, you know, a crescendo of strings in the background. None of that. So it is literally 15 men in a room. And the only music there is, is the final scene where I think it's Heydrich um, puts on, what is it, Haydn or something? He Schub, puts a, Schub, Schubert, Schub, is it? I was right? listening to it yesterday, actually. It's a beautiful scene. Okay. And, he, and there's this wonderful scene. That, that scene itself is very telling because I wrote down the quote. He says... He puts this uh, Schubert on the on the gramophone, as they would have called it then, uh, and he says to to the assemble. It's then it's only Muller who's the head of Gestapo and Heydrich are the only two left, 
and he says, you know, this is a shoe, but whatever. And he says, the adagio will tear your heart out, right? And I, I which is a wonderful scene. And then, and then suddenly Tucci Eichmann, you know, talk, calls it sort of what a sentimental Viennese shit or something like that. It's a wonderful, wonderful scene. But there, this is another crucial element. I said before how highly educated these people were in the main. There's a couple of exceptions, but generally eight PhDs in a room of, of 15 people. But there's also this element, and Heydrich himself is that, right? He, his father ran the conservatoire in, uh, in Halle and der Saale, uh, in central Germany. He grew up in a, in a very, very cultured household. He played the violin to a great, to a really good level. So hence that comment. You know, he used to, he used to play sort of violin duets with Admiral Canaris, for example. Right, who was you know in touch with the resistance and so on, but they had a they had a curious close relationship the two of them, and they used to play these sort of duets, the, the violin duets together and things like that in their spare time. So he was a tremendously cultured individual, and yet he's doing he's hosting that meeting, he's doing what he's doing. So they get this element, this aspect of the sort of cultured savage, right, which is really quite complex. This is not, and this is where what I think. In the broader sense, this is what sets the Holocaust apart from, you know, for example, you know, the mass killing in the Soviet Union by the NKVD, because this is genocide by a cultured people backed by a sort of, you know, a thoroughgoing philosophy, an idea that this is we're having to do this because it's for the good of mankind. And by in contrast, you've got, you know, the NKVD in the Soviet Union. You know, generally the people doing the killing are peasant boys who are terrified of their superiors and are doing it because they're told to do it. Right. There is a philosophy there. Absolutely. But they're still, you know, the people at the sharp end are are not they don't have that sort of level level of of culture, if you like, that you do in Nazi Germany. So it's that that I think sets it apart. Um, and this is something that is a wonderful quote that always stays with me. Golo Mann, who's a German writer and sort of popular historian. Um, from the from the uh, I think immediate post war period largely, but he had this wonderful quote where he talked about Nazi Germany as turning a nation of I'm going to do it in German and then translate it because it works so beautifully in German. It turned a nation of as he put it Dichter und Denker into a nation of Richter und Henker. So there's a wonderful symmetry and and, and rhythm about that. But Dichter und Denker is thinkers and poets. So it's turned a nation of thinkers and poets into a nation of judges and hangmen, right? Uh, and I think that sums up the sort of the 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 sort of bizarre conundrum at the heart of Nazism is that it 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 took these people, as I said, eight PhDs, most of them in law in that room, and they are discussing the crime of the century in the most in the coldest you know, most brutal terms. So it, that to me is the sort of fascination of, of what Nazism did to the German people. What, you know, that, that the, the, the metastasis that it represented was that it turned this hugely cultured nation into a nation of killers. Yeah, I suppose a lot of the work in getting them to that stage had already been done in the 20s and 30s. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. All right. Well, you mentioned categories, so we should probably start those so yes we what this is what we normally do roger tim and i we pick our uh category they're ne often named after a particular actor or film because okay, okay. so uh, i can't remember what order i sent them to you in have you got them are you looking at them uh I, i've got the first one i've got down is best scene yes right okay but best scene. so as you say it's really you could say the whole film yeah uh, but, I actually, but i actually was going to nominate that one at the end with the 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 music the Schubert yeah Peter Schubert yeah because it did show a contrast between Eichmann who for a start he doesn't disagree with Heydrich no. you know when Heydrich says oh it'll tear your heart out I Eichmann because well actually I find it Vinny shit I think it's Vinny <laughs> shit yeah no actually, well he, he would be a fool to, to contradict I, uh, Heydrich right so he yeah didn't do it. yeah yeah he's a very sort of you know he's he's really Eichmann, I mean, I guess we'll get on to actor and, and, and supporting actor, but maybe we park Tucci's portrayal of Eichmann. But that scene was really good because there's another yeah. S and not particularly nasty. Well, they're all nasty, but a, 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 an especially nasty SS 
uh, general with him, Heinrich Müller. Müller, Müller. Müller was the head, his very shadowy character, played by Brendan Coyle, who, of course, later famous for Downton, of all things. And it's quite strange. It's quite strange to see him playing such a sinister character. Um, yeah, he- Müller's a really interesting character because he's so he's so shadowy. He He was head of the Gestapo by this point. Um, had gone up through, I think, through the Munich police initially, joined the Nazi party. And, you know, that brought with it a senior rank in the SS, but he was head of the Gestapo, basically. And in that film, I mean, he barely strings, you know, two sentences together. He's a very sort of dark, saturnine, silent character in the whole thing. And we don't know much about him, is the curious thing. He disappears at the end of the war. So he's one of those people, a bit like Borman. All right, the Borman story has been solved because they've, they've, you know, they've identified him um, from, uh, from DNA records when his body was found in the 1970s, since been, since been identified. Um, but for a long time, you know, where, where was Borman was a kind of a question. And, and where was Muller was a question as well, because he literally disappeared at the end of the war. Never found, no proof of death, anything like that. Um, so really shadowy character. And I think actually that sort of very understated the way he's portrayed by Brendan Coyle actually works really well because it brings out that that sort of darkness in him. You know, that he, he is someone that we don't know much about. Yeah, he should be. I mean, if he's head of the Gestapo, he should be, you know, one of the big, big names. Like Absolutely. Like yeah. Borman. And so is the implication being because I always assumed having, you know, read uh, read a few books, including Berlin at War mm. by yourself. Of course. And Berlin. Uh, with the Russians advancing that if you disappeared, basically you were killed somehow you either killed yeah. yourself and they just didn't find the body. But is there an implication that in the case of, of Borman and, and maybe with Muller that they somehow found their ways to, I mean, obviously the, the Borman ones being disproved as you've yeah. just said, but yeah, the, yeah. the implication being that they ended up in South America. Uh, I think that was for a long time was the assumption as we know, I mean, Borman's body was found, I think in 1973 um, was later identified by um, by DNA records, um, courtesy of his of his um, son. So that you know the Borman question is now cut and dried. We know that was Borman. He was found very not far from what is now the the main railway station in Berlin, incidentally, um, very close to there. So he he was last seen, I think, crossing the Weidendammer Bridge um, in central Berlin. Uh, in a firefight with the Russians, uh, basically trying to escape. And actually where his body is found is only about a mile away from there to the west. So that makes sense. He's trying to get away from that uh, particular conflict. So anyway, the the, the, the Borman question is, is solved. But Muller is still, to a large extent, I think, being wrestled over. I mean, that, that was there was a, a theory came out about 10 years ago, probably, that there was a body sort of disposed in a mass grave in a, in a, in a cemetery of sort of victims of the, of the street fighting at the end of the war that supposedly was his. And I think that, I think the story came from the, whoever it was that was clearing the bodies, you know, recognized that this was a high ranking individual because of the uniform he was wearing, but he was dumped in a mass grave with everyone else. So that that's kind of, you know, hearsay. It's not really, it won't stand up in court obviously, but uh, it's hearsay that, that, uh, that Muller died, you know, in the battle for Berlin, which is entirely logical, as you say, because it was, it was chaotic and it was murderous and nobody was counting the bodies or seeing who they were. So I don't, you know, I think that's fair comment to, to, to uh, assume that he didn't uh, escape anywhere else. Uh, I think the numbers that actually did escape to South America is, are actually relatively small. Um, and that tended to, again, that tended to be used as a stick, particularly by the Russians. It, it was used as a stick with which to beat the Western allies um, to say, well, you're all complicit in allowing these bastards to escape, you know. Um, and that, and that, you know that's proven. There's a, there was a thing called Operation Myth, um, which all sort of bled into the you know, the mythology around Hitler's own death as well, where you know the Soviets were actively promoting the idea that Hitler had survived and escaped to South America along with you know various others because it was a good stick with which to beat the West. You know, it's the opening opening shots of the Cold War to a large extent. Even though to, they had his skull in, even in though Boston, they had his skull, yeah. they knew very well that that, yeah. that, that he he he'd not survived. You know, the bunker. Um, they had what remained of his of his jaw, for example, uh, identified by his dentist. I mean, all this is all this is proven is on record. And yet they still sort of beat the drum that uh, that the West had allowed him to escape, had facilitated his escape. And he was hiding with the sort of, you know, the, the, the quasi fascist, um, you know, Argentinians at the time. So uh, yeah, that was that was all a propaganda exercise. Well, you say that, though, but, you know, we've mentioned Ian McNeese's portrayal of 
Gerhard Klopfer. Mm. And he, I mean, it's interesting at the end, you get the credits, well, but just before the credits, you get the little info panel on each participant and, and it explains what happened to them. A number survived the war and yep. Klopfer lives to lives till 1987. Yes. He's the, he's the last, the last survivor of the participants. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, it's 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 things like that that I you know I mean, I mean it's, it is astonishing. I mean that's the same yeah. year same year that um, Rudolf Hess died as well, of course. Mm. And I and I can remember very clearly hearing on the radio when Hess died, and I I just thought I you know being astonished that he was still alive. It was like oh my god, it's sort of a name from the distant past. Yeah, but like again, like like Klopfer, you say Hess died in nineteen in uh, eighty seven. Uh, because I mean before before I sort of uh, you know trigger a load of uh, angry emails. Of course, in terms of, you know, escapes to uh, South America, Eichmann, of course, himself was one of those who benefited from the rat lines and all that. So I'm not at all saying that, that those net networks didn't exist and that people didn't use them. I'm just saying that, you know, I think the, the scale of that and the, and the number of prominent individuals that used it is sometimes exaggerated uh, for, uh, for propaganda purposes and, and traditionally has been for that reason. Yes, yeah, so Klopfer became a tax advisor yeah yeah yeah, and when when he died his family issued a a notice i think in the newspaper saying he had a fulfilled life that was to the benefit of all those who came under his sphere of influence wow yeah wow right so back to best scene so i I mean i you know i think that classical music because it does kind of show the the heydrich eichmann dynamic and yeah. as you say, the sort of cultured savage side. Yes, of yes, that that absolutely. I I can go along with that. I do, as I mentioned before, that confrontation between Stuckert and Klopfer. If we can sort of isolate that and call it a scene, I think that is really, I think it's brilliantly acted as well. Particularly Colin Firth, the way he, the way he portrays that sort of righteous rage at being accused of being a friend of the Jews is, is brilliant. You know, he's brilliant there. And it, and it actually as a scene, you know, in terms of, in terms of the history as well, it does tell us a lot. I think, you know, it tells us about, you know, the, the, the that legalistic nature about the, the, the nature of antisemitism to a large extent, you know, you've got that sort of the visceral antisemitism of the, of the xenophobe, which is what Klopfer kind of represents, you know, um, and then you've got the, the the different sort of anti-Semitism of someone like Stuckert, which is much more, if you like, intellectual. He's saying, you know, I hate these people because I understand how how uh, how devious they are, you know, and they're going to undermine us and they're going to find loopholes in the law. It's a, it's a sort of a di- different a different trait or a different aspect of anti-Semitism. So I think that particular scene brings a lot to the table, and it's a really a really dramatic scene as well. Okay, let's go with that one then. Um, that wins the Zapruder Award for best scene. <laughs> right, right. The Argo Award for most inaccurate. Um, which is di- again, it's difficult. But then they had to make up some of the. So I yeah. guess it's, it could be easily be the Schubert p- scene. Yes, I mean that 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 is obviously well. We assume that's sort of invented, but it but it speaks to a to a deeper truth as well. As I said, that you know how cultured Heydrich actually was. You know that's 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 a historical fact i think where i would i know i'm trampling on your on your um suggestions here ollie a little bit you I'm can sorry, do what you like it's i'm, very I'm being i'm being hydrich to your to your uh, uh to nice. your eichmann it's i'm nice sorry about that. um but i'd say i would say that the kritzinger element that is that is as far as we can tell invented so where they where they've got the scenes with kritzinger the half-heartedly we have to say objecting that's that seems to be pure invention so to my mind, if we're going to if we're going to have an in- inaccurate scene, I think it probably has to be, you know, those that involve Kritzinger. And I suppose the makers had to have an individual who had to put up some kind of albeit half yes. hearted struggle. Otherwise, yeah. it doesn't really work. Otherwise, yeah. it doesn't work. There's no there's no drama there. Yeah. You know? yeah. 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 There's a very good the bit where um, Heydrich says to Kritzinger, you would be a hard man to take down, but not impossible. Yeah. 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 Wonderful. Yeah. Wonderful. yeah. Wonderful. Kenneth Branagh, right. So that wins the Argo Award, right? Simon Baker Award. Do you know who Simon Baker is? I don't. Tell He's me. an Australian actor, and he gives a very good performance in the film Margin Call, all about uh-huh. the financial crash. So convincing that aspects of history has named the best performance award after him. Brilliant. Well done. 
hope to get him on the podcast one day. Yes. We're huge fans. Right. Um, (laughs) So I think it's going to be very difficult to get. This is sort of lead role. This is going to be difficult to pick anyone else other than Kenneth Branagh for me. Yeah, I, I, I have to agree. I mean, Branagh, that sort of that that coldness that he brings to the role, which is utterly convincing as a portrayal of Heydrich. Of course, we don't know what Heydrich is like in person particularly much, but, you know, he's he's completely convincing as Heydrich. So both sort of, you know, in terms of character and, and historically, you know, as far as what we can know. So, yeah, I, I, it's hard to see past Brenner for that one. And I guess he does dominate. Is not really anyone else apart from maybe Stanley Tucci, Mm. Who's who's in it as much as yes, um, as, as... and Tucci is brilliant, by the way, as well. I mean, he really is. You mentioned it earlier on the way in which he is very obviously subordinate to to Heydrich, and almost obsequious in that yes. sense. And yet, when he's dealing with his underlings, like when the when the waiter drops the tray of food, you know, he says, you know, um, clean this up, and you know he pays you know report to me and he pays he's absolutely brutal downwards and obsequious okay. upwards so it actually shows you a lot of the you know the real nature of that nazi hierarchy it was a brutal place yeah i i was imagining being a waiter in that in the in the villa because presumably you were a member of the working class yeah. you weren't necessarily a nazi party member Presumably, I mean, they they would have you would have been uh, you know sort of security checked and so on, but you know they they wouldn't necessarily I wouldn't imagine have even been SS men. They would they could very easily have just been you know um, you know local staff. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, so best supporting then is Stanley Tucci. I think everything David Threlfall is in, he's brilliant. Yes, uh, he plays Kritzinger. Yes. Colin Firth, of course. Colin Firth, he... I would I would I think Stuckert. I mean, obviously, I mean, if we're going to have Branner in the best best performance and then best supporting performance the the standout is probably Tucci in that sense i would make a make a case for the stuckert um, for colin, colin Firth, Firth, as yeah, stuckert yeah. because he because again i think the way he inhabits that character and brings those arguments that he makes abhorrent though they are the way he brings those arguments to the table and so so effectively i think that was really strong but it's realistically, it's hard to see past Tucci in that in that I, role. I do think Barnaby K was very good as Langer. The, yes, the... that was another one that I I uh, Langer. You know, Langer's the is the um, SD major who's been out in the Baltic. You know, doing the mass shootings and so on. And what this is, uh, we mentioned it before we came on. There was an element in my head whenever I thought about conspiracy because I saw it, you know, a few times way back in the day and I haven't seen it for ages until re-watching it this week. In my head always, I had the Langer character, you know, kind of chain smoking, which he is, but also, you know, with the shakes and, you know, showing all of those, uh, all of the evidence of sort of mental strain because of what he's doing. And when I re-watched it, that was much less in evidence than I thought it, it was before. I still think he's, uh, you know, it's a very subtle performance. He's, as I said, he is chain smoking. He's very kind of agitated when he makes that interjection, when he says, you know, you know, I've, I've been evacuating sort of 30,000 people to the east. Is this what you're talking about? So there's a, there's, a, there's a sort of a controlled, he's almost like he's on the edge of a nervous breakdown. And I think that's, that comes across really well. Um, so you know that absolutely. I think he's. I had down on my sheet Langer, Tucci, and then Stuckert as well. Of course, we're in perfect agreement. I, I, we are. It's interesting that um, they often mention the SS men. They often mention that they're soldiers and the honor of the soldier. Mm. But they, I guess, they genuinely believed it. But they s- seem to just kill innocent civilians. I know they weren't innocent civilians in their view, but. You know, yeah. it's not like they were advancing, you know, uh, to uh, identify a, 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 a hilltop. They had to secure a bridgehead or something. Yeah. They're, yeah. They're, 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 as Langer says, they're killing 30,000 yeah. men, men, women, women and children, children which yeah. he says, he says women and children is actually a little bit difficult to, for the men yeah. to kill. And it was absolutely. Yeah. I mean, that's that's one of the that's one of the drivers towards this you know, as we put it in inverted commas, more humane methods of killing yes. um, is to take the onus off, the emotional onus off ordinary soldiers. Now, you have to bear in mind the vast majority of those doing the killing. Now, Langer oversaw it, 
but he wasn't necessarily the one who was who was pulling the trigger. Those pulling the trigger could have been, as we said before, reserve policemen who weren't necessarily, you know, the cutting edge in terms of ideological indoctrination or the rest of it. They were, you know, ordinary police reservists from from, you know, from Hamburg and from Berlin. So many of them even came from, you know, left wing backgrounds. They weren't even Nazis necessarily. So this, I mean, the, um, Christopher Browning wrote a brilliant book. I'm sure everyone knows it. Um, ordinary Men, Battalion 101. Um, which is a micro study of one particular battalion of these Einsatzgruppen. And he shows in that that, you know, what motivates them isn't isn't ideology. You know, and the the group that he uses are literally what I just described. They're reserve policemen. They're in their 40s. They all have wives and children. And they come from the sort of socialist suburbs of Hamburg. So, you know, this, this isn't your sort of, um, you know, hard, hard faced SS indoctrinated killer. This is people like you and me, Ollie. And it and it and the point is that it had a psychological effect, because those killers, it stayed with them, right? Not not everyone is a psychopath, you know. The, there's a higher proportion of psychopaths in society than we probably are comfortable with. That's a fact of life, but they're not enough to you know to for people to go and do that and be comfortable with it. So the vast majority of those doing the killing were in inverted commas ordinary germans and they they self-medicated with beer some of them committed suicide you know they used to go and get absolutely smashed with with vodka afterwards and this had an effect on their on their psychological state and there's a wonderful scene which is again very often retold in histories of the holocaust where himmler goes to one of these goes to the the graveside of one of these mass killings um near minsk i think it was and is you know his his long leather coat is splattered with somebody's brains and he's nearly sick you know he goes he goes sort of milk white and is nearly sick and afterwards he's he's sort of ha sitting down having dinner with the the commander of the Einsatzgruppe and he says to him what are we doing what are we doing with our young men he's concerned about the mental health and the moral what's the word the sort of moral okay. Yeah, moral decay, the sort of steadfastness. How long can they keep doing this right. before they're sort of before they're utterly and irrevocably damaged by it? This is what he's thinking. So this is what leads to this idea of, you know, more humane methods of killing humane for the killers, not the killed. Right. So that, you know, that's a that's a really interesting aspect of it. Mm. OK, so best support. I think we're, we I think we're saying are we saying Stanley Tucci, aren't we? I think we are. I think we are yeah. with with honourable mentions for uh, Colin Firth uh, and, as you say, Barnaby K as Langer. And uh, did, in the trial of Eichmann, did he reveal any more about the Van Say? I, I know, know he said he. I don't know. Almost he wasn't apologetic at all about the Holocaust. He regretted he couldn't have done more. Yeah, there's. Uh, I'm, I must say, I'm not much of an expert on the Eichmann trial itself, um, but I think you know there are two different sides to him. So what he what he sort of curated, the image that he curated at his trial is of a rather colourless bureaucrat, of a pen pusher, of someone who'd never killed anyone in his life, right? Um, and this is where you got that phrase from Hannah Arendt about the banality of evil, because he sort of portrayed himself like he's a you know, provincial accountant. And he looked like a provincial accountant, with apologies to all provincial accountants that are listening. Um but then there's a sort of private argument. So there was a famous um, audio tape, an audio interview made with him by a sort of um, a Dutch fascist who also escaped to South America. Um, and in that in that audio tape, which was which was not uh, admissible evidence at the Eichmann trial, but that tape was made, you know, in the in the 1950s. And in that, he's much more bloodthirsty. And he, he, there's this line where he says, you know, he would cheer, cheerfully, you know, jump in his grave uh, in the knowledge that he'd helped to, you know, eliminate however many million Jews it was. Um, so that, that shows a much more bloodthirsty, much more brutally anti-Semitic Eichmann. Um, so we have to be careful as to, you know, just, you know, that phrase, the banality of evil always gets trotted out. And it, there's something to it. Uh, but we have to be careful of applying that to someone like Eichmann because we're then buying into that very carefully curated image that he presented at his trial, which is not really the real person. Yeah. I mean, he was meticulous. There's a scene in the film. I'm sorry, I'm going on a bit. There's a wonderful scene in the film where he talks about going to have Hebrew lessons with a with a rabbi. Right. But he did that. Right. He was that meticulous that he 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 wanted to go and learn Hebrew so he could understand his enemy better. 
right? So he did have uh, Hebrew lessons. I think that that scene, perhaps with the with the with the rabbi and saying that um, you know these people are so stupid. Why did he go out on you know and, and get caught? Because didn't he know I would have I would have uh, saved him uh, at least until the end of my lessons? You know, it's a wonderful. It's a one again. That's one of the sort of those scenes that I had scribbled down here as a as a as a possible, and um, because he tells that anecdote with. And it, it reveals a lot about the man as well. It reveals something from the historical record. So I think that's that, that that's quite a sort of uh, a profound scene. It's amazing. All these actors. I mean, every single one of them. They when they deliver their lines, you just believe they're, they're so com- they're so believable in their roles. There's yeah. not one I think who who you watch and you think oh, I'm not sure about that. They all. I don't know if it's a Shakespearean thing. With they're all a lot of them. I think fourteen of the fifteen are British or yeah. irish yeah and so have a kind of With the exception of Tucci. yeah yes and maybe come from a tradition of of maybe speaking more lines um without interruption yeah but it's it's well done by all of them really it is and and actually i think uh your last your last um category here i had on my list was legacy rating yeah which i assume is you know sort of shorthand for um you know being of historical value I suppose. well yeah the, it, it it's partly that it's partly that it's 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 the film even being remembered today because right. you know probably the, our highest power legacy rating is probably the most inaccurate historically uh, we've done which is jfk mm. and that caused the us congress i think to set up a a a, a assassinations committee right so that's yeah. quite a quite a powerful because it, because it pushed to push the uh conspiracy idea yeah exactly yeah, exactly yeah, yeah. and and then and yet you know the first film we did in the film club was lincoln the steven spielberg film yeah. which i don't think no one really mentions nowadays no which no. is interesting given you know it was made before probably all the culture wars started yeah. and so slavery being a big deal i would have thought it would be raised a little bit more than it than it is yes Yes, you're right. So um, in that context, that's that's kind of yeah. but the historical th- side of things. You know, we are speaking. At, at, at some listeners might listen to another history podcast that is currently doing a, a Nazi series, and it is a very, very good Nazi series, brilliant Nazi series. Yeah. So actually, this episode is a very nice compliment. It's to a that. nice compl- complimentary uh, contribution to that. It and is. I was going to say, I mean, by by my by my interpretation of your legacy rating. Excuse me if I sort of bastardise it. It's fine. Um, in terms of you know marrying, I mean, it's a very difficult thing to marry, you know, historical accuracy with really good filmmaking. And so often, you know, one or other gets lost in the wayside. Uh, I think this is a really good example of where that 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 you know those two those two demanding mistresses, as it were, are both satisfied very well because this brings it really does help us to understand what the conference was. It helps us to understand you know where it fits in the Holocaust. You know, they've got all of the elements there that that would have been discussed. You know, that sort of tension between you know those that want to you know use the Jews for labour, for example prior to or instead of exterminating them that those those opinions are expressed that sort of curiously legalistic element that we talked about expressed by Stuckert. you've got that sort of bizarre hierarchy within the third reich the sort of bizarre competition for competence which is inhabited by heydrich so there's so much going on there and you know langer with that whole question of the you know the morale amongst those who are at the sharp end doing the shooting um, there's so much going on there that I, you know, as a historical document, I think it works really, really well. You know, it really does. And as we said before, as a, it's, it's almost a courtroom drama. Also, as filmmaking, works brilliantly well. So it, it, it's a rare thing that it actually ticks both of those boxes with a plum. Yeah, absolutely. Well, Roger, this has been absolutely a, a tour de force. I've loved Thank listening you. to everything you've been saying about it. It's actually wonderful. The film is is brilliant. I was I sent you an email on Friday. I was watching it again. It was just it's a particularly nasty film, I think. It just covers such horrific subject matter. But I, I think would, it's some- I would I would qualify that, Ollie, if I may. I I think it's kind of quietly nasty, you know, it, yeah. it, because nothing ever there's nothing explicit. Nothing ever kind of happens that, you know, you'd have to shield your eyes from. You wouldn't have to hide behind the sofa. The 
the, yeah, the wider, language is the yeah. wider context is horrific and would make you want to hide behind the sofa. And, th- and that I think is, again, is a, is a tribute to the genius of the filmmaking because it, it, it's, it takes the idea of the euphemism and all those euphemisms that were used in the conference itself. It takes that to another level because it euphemizes, you know, its content as well. Um, because it is it is sanitized to some extent, but you know, brilliantly so, and I, I think it has a real tension because of that. Uh, yeah, I, I, I really I, watching it again, tremendously impressed. The only the only thing I would say, the only thing that, of annoyance, is that it's not available on any of these sort of main platforms. Uh, yes, which I'm, I'm sure you're going to mention, but you know, we had to, both of us had to go to the dark side to find a copy of it to watch. I don't know why this is, but it's it seems bizarre because, as I said, as I've said, I think it's one of the best films of the last twenty years. Yeah, it's. I I will put links to a a listener very kindly sent me a link to something to an app and a website that you can go to where you type in the film and it tells you what platform it's on, mm-hmm. and you can feed it to tell it what platforms you have. So I'll put that on there and and listeners can check that. They might have, I think Now TV might, it might be available on Now TV, Good. which I think linked to Sky. Right. I'll link that in. Roger, that's been brilliant. You've articulated what, what the type of film is much better than I did. So thank you for that. And actually I was thinking July 44 yeah. is the is the plot against Hitler. It is indeed. Is is the Valkyrie film? Are you a thumbs yeah, up? Yes, shall we shall we shall we reconvene for that? God, Roger. Since you offered. <laughs> no, that'd be fun. Let's do that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That'd be great. Yeah, because I think that's actually not uh, I was watching that again because I got I went down a sort of Nazi uh, a Nazi rabbit hole. films. Yeah, I watched Downfall <laughs> as well. Right. And I thought that was uh, I thought Valkyrie was pretty good actually. It is surprisingly good. I mean, we'll save our save our um, yeah. our material for for July, but it is surprisingly good. It's surprisingly close to the historical record, I think. Which, uh, yeah, yeah, as I said, I was surprised as surprised as anyone when it came out yeah. because um, you don't you, when you see Tom Cruise, you don't think uh, historically uh, accurate, do you? No, you don't. And we'll get to talk about Kenneth Branagh again. Um, Indeed. So, Roger, thank you so much. Links, listeners, links are in the show notes for everything we've discussed, including Roger's books, his latest, The Forgers, which is excellent. I really recommend that. Wonderful. Thank you, Ollie. Thanks. Thanks so much for listening. Links are in the show notes. Plenty more history to come. And please do get in touch if you've got any questions or comments. In the meantime, thank you and good night. <laughs>